Before we begin the presentation, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Colin Chang. A full speaker bio can be found in the blue widget at the bottom right of your console. Colin is a scientist in the Pharmacometrics Group at Sertara Strategic Consulting. His experience includes non-compartmental as well as population PKPD modeling and simulation methods in support of drug development programs. Colin earned his master's degree in physiology from McGill University. Colin, welcome to today's event. I'll now turn it over to him to begin today's presentation. All right, thanks, Suzanne. So, hi, everyone. Um, for today's webinar, I'll be discussing a bit using, uh, about using Phoenix NLME to explore how different dose escalation regimens affect exposure in subjects with varying degrees of liver impairment. So just as a quick aside, does anyone remember FenFen? So at the time, back in the 1990s, it was thought to be a miracle drug that could cure obesity, and millions of patients were given prescriptions um, for this new drug therapy. But it soon became obvious that this drug combination had some pretty serious cardiovascular side effects, which were mostly attributed to the first ingredient, fenfluramine, leading to its withdrawal from the market and lots of lawsuits. However, the second ingredient, fentamine, was not withdrawn, and development of uh, fentamine in combination with other medications as a treatment for obesity has continued since then. The first of these combination drugs is Qsimia, which was approved in 2012 by the FDA for the treatment of obesity. It's a fixed-dose combination product consisting of immediate-release fentamine and modified-release topiramate. During drug development, a single-dose hepatic impairment PK study was performed by the drug manufacturer. Based on the results of this study, a dosage warning was included in the prescribing information relating to patients with hepatic impairment. Subsequently, in Europe, when the EMA regulators looked at this, they wanted to better assess the impact of hepatic impairment on fentamine and topiramate exposure with this drug. More specifically, they wanted us to build a PAPI-K model relating clearance to the degree of hepatic impairment and perform simulations to assess the implications of various dosing regimens on drug exposure in these liver-impaired patients. So right away, you can see the value of modeling and simulation. The regulators themselves are increasingly requesting it, and it allows you to explore different dosing regimens given only relatively limited single-dose data. And from an ethical standpoint, you don't have to give these drugs to patients who already have liver issues. And you aren't limited to just hepatic impairment. You can also work with other special populations, uh, such as patients with renal impairment, which is something we also ended up doing in response to the EMA for this drug, although this webinar will focus uh, mainly on the hepatic impairment model. So to answer these questions from the EMA regulators, the objective of this project was to conduct PAPI-K modeling and simulation using data from the single-dose hepatic impairment study to better characterize the steady-state exposure of fentamine and topiramate after following the recommended titration and maintenance schedule. In addition, we needed to assess the drug manufacturer's suggested dosing regimens and make a dosing recommendation in subjects with varying degrees of hepatic impairment. So just a bit of background on fentamine and topiramate. So fentamine on its own was originally approved by the FDA in 1959 as an appetite suppressant, readily absorbed from the GI tract, and there are two main metabolic pathways via CYP3A4, whereby P-hydroxylation on the aromatic ring and N oxidation on the aliphatic side chain can occur. 7 to 60% of the dose is excreted unchanged in the urine, but the amount of, uh, being excreted is highly dependent on the urine pH. And the mean life is about 25 hours. Now for topiramate, it was first discovered in 1979 and approved by the FDA in 1996 as an anticonvulsant. Um, as a side effect, though, it had the effect of promoting weight loss, and so it was often prescribed off-label for that purpose. Readily absorbed from the GI tract, not extensively metabolized, but rather mostly excreted in the urine, and has a terminal half-life of about 65 hours. Regarding the relevant regulatory and legal environment, the FDA has a clinical pharmacology guidance that describes analysis of hepatic impairment data including a section referencing the use of PAPI-K methods, such as what I'll be showing you in the upcoming slides. 
In Europe, there was a Court of Justice decision in 2003 which confirmed the withdrawal of market authorization for amphetamine-like anorectic drugs such as fentamine. More recently, there was also a 2012 EMA decision to keep this drug off the European market, mainly due to cardiovascular safety concerns, but it still remains approved for the U.S. market. So now a little bit of description of the hepatic impairment study, whose data we'll be using for the population modeling. It was a phase one, open label, single dose study in 16 subjects with mild to moderate hepatic impairment, according to the Child Pew classification system, and in eight subjects with normal hepatic function. Subjects were male or female, between 39 and 62 years of age, body weights between 58 and 112 kilograms, and BMIs between 22 and 38 kilograms per square meter. Under fasted conditions, patients were given one capsule containing 15 milligrams of fentamine and 92 milligrams of topiramine. Finally, 18 blood samples were collected from pre-dose to 192 hours post-dose to determine fentamine and topiramate uh, concentrations in plasma. So now, uh, we just wanted to have a quick poll question at this point to find out a little bit uh, more about your backgrounds. Do you all have experience with Phoenix Winonlin, Phoenix Winonlin and NLME, or neither? So we'll just wait for a few seconds while everyone um, gets their selections in. Feel a little bit like a game show host here. So, all right. So, if we go to the results slide, we'll see that um, most people have experience using at least Phoenix One on Lin, and a good chunk of you also have experience with NLME. So, if if you just have experience using Phoenix um, Wind on Lin. Well, if you have experience with neither, first of all, I mean, the nice thing about Phoenix is, it, is that it has a nice graphical interface, or GUI, which makes the learning curve a lot less steep, um, because you can just point and click your mouse and use radio buttons and drop-down menus. If you only have experience with Phoenix Wind on Lin, it's also an easy transition to NLME, um, as both are within the same platform and use the exact same interface. And so all you would need to do is you add a Phoenix model object to your workflow, and then you're basically off and running. So getting back to the population modeling, uh, we constructed a data set with the con concentrations from the hepatic impairment study. And for each subject, we assigned a, a hepatic impairment group according to the child pew classes as described in the FDA guidance. So for instance, we assigned group one for the normal subjects, group two for the mild impairment subjects, and group three for the moderately impaired patients. Um, again, the software we used for modeling was Phoenix NLME, 1.3. Uh, we use the default minimization engine, although Phoenix has, I believe, six other algorithms available to use. And this, by the way, is the Phoenix GUI that I was referring to before. So it you can see the drop-down menus and radio buttons. All subjects were included in the poppy K analysis with no exclusions for a total of 383 fentramine concentrations and 409 topiramate concentrations. So this is just a slide now to illustrate the general modeling and simulation framework that we used. During the model discrimination process, we tested various base models with different structures and error models. For instance, models with one and two compartments and with and without lag time. We found that the model for fentamine with the lowest objective function value, which implies how well the model is fitting the observed data, was a one compartment model with linear elimination between subject variability on clearance, volume, Ka, and lag time, correlation between clearance and volume, and using an additive error model. For topiramate, the base model we identified was a two-compartment model with linear elimination between subject variability on clearances, volume, Ka, and T lag, and using additive and proportional error models. We then created some exploratory plots to identify potential trends between the structural parameters and covariates, such as body weight, sex, and hepatic impairment. In the end, we identified hepatic impairment status as a small but statistically significant covariate explaining the variability of clearance for fentamine, but not for topiramate. So here are the plots for the fentamine-based model without hepatic impairment as a covariate on the left, and, and the final model with hepatic impairment on clearance on the right. As you can see, without the hepatic impairment, 
there's a trend whereby clearance decreases with increasing severity of hepatic impairment. When hepatic impairment is added to the model on the right, this trend is eliminated. And basically, the purpose of incorporating this known or predictable hepatic impairment effect on clearance into the model is that so we can better measure other sources of variability affecting clearance. Okay, so now here are a couple tables showing the structural parameter values from the final models that we developed. As you can see, we have parameters of Ka, lag time, and volume for the fentamine model on the, the top left. And as I mentioned in the last slide, we have hepatic impairment status uh, as a covariate explaining the variability of fentamine on clear, uh, the, explaining the variability of fentamine clearance. Um, and on the bottom left, you can see a topiramate model with, with structural parameters of Ka, lag time, central and peripheral clearance, and central and peripheral volume. Typical values, which represent the average population values, um, are populated from the theta table output in Phoenix, with the topiramate table being populated in much the same way. The omega table values, which is also from the Phoenix output, are used to calculate BSV or between subject uh, variability, which represents the unexplained random differences that you see between individuals. You can also see that the shrinkage values, shrinkage values are populated directly from the omega table output, and there was also a positive correlation between clearance and volume of 0.521, which is an indication that these parameters are related and they change together in concert to a certain degree. This slide is just to briefly show you the actual code used to model the fentamine exposure in Phoenix. On the line for structural parameters, you can see that the clearance is set to vary directly according to hepatic impairment group. So you can see here another nice feature in Phoenix, which is that it's very scalable according to what you want to do. So for most of your modeling, maybe 80 to 90% of it, you can use the GUI. But if there's more complex things you want to do, um, you can switch to the textual mode and use the Phoenix modeling language to customize the code according to your needs. It can also be a good learning tool because Phoenix lets you switch back and forth between the GUI and the code. So you can implement something in the GUI, switch back to the text interface, and then see how the software translated those tick boxes and selections that you made into equations and code. So once we have run the final model based on the data from the single dose study, we're ready to run some simulations, which will let us better explore and visualize the steady state exposure. The first step in simulations is to store the postdoc parameter values from the final model run. The next step is to merge the postdoc parameters from the actual subjects and the time points which we wish to simulate into a table. We then created a dosing sheet, as you see at the bottom right, according to the different dosing regimens that we want to simulate for each subject, indicating subject, dose times, dosing amounts, additional doses to be administered, the dosing interval, and dosing group. For instance, these are the recommended dosing regimens for Qsimia, which is to take 3.75 milligrams daily for 14 days, uh, followed by daily dosing of 7.5 milligrams. If weight, loss, if weight loss goals were not achieved, then dose titration to 11.25 milligrams and then 15 milligrams can be done, with the exception of moderate, uh, moderate hepatic impairment patients who are not to exceed the 7.5 milligram dose. Since we want to use our actual individual postdoc parameters, one little trick is in the model code, we can freeze the initial estimates for the fixed effects to one. Now in the structural parameter equations, multiplying by the fixed effects values of one, will simplify the equations and allow the model to use the parameters that we're directly providing to it. The last step is to make sure that the run mode is on simulations predictive check with the number of iterations set to zero, which tells the model to generate the individual concentration time data using the supplied postdoc parameters. This individual concentration time data is generated as part of the additional output as a CSV file, which you can then use to plot your concentration time profile. So now here are some graphs created in Phoenix that come from plotting the mean profiles of the simulated concentration time data for fentamine, uh, which is on the top, and topiramate, which is on the bottom. You can see that the black line represents normal hepatic function subjects, 
The blue lines represent moderately impaired uh, patients, and the green line represent uh, the blue line represents the mild impaired patients, and the green line represents the moderately impaired patients. So once again, for all subjects, the recommended starting dose is 3.75 milligrams, followed by 7.5 milligrams. And if the weight loss gains have not been achieved, the dosage can be increased to 11.25 milligrams, followed by 15 milligrams. Um, and this is for the normal and mild hepatic impairment patients. For the moderate hepatic impair impairment patients, no further dose escalation is called for after steady state is reached. So as you can see in these graphs, for both phantamine and topiramate, you can clearly see that with the decreased clearance, concentrations are higher with increasing severity of hepatic impairment. Now this is just a table showing steady state exposure parameters for the 50 milligram dose only at different hepatic impairment levels. The patients with mild hepatic impairment would receive a 25% higher steady state exposure as compared to that observed in the normal patients. For comparison, we can look at the PK parameters from the single-dose hepatic impairment study. And as you can see, the empirical AUC values are comparable to the simulated parameters, taking into account variability in the data, which helps to provide some confirmation that our model is behaving appropriately. Here are the same tables, but this time for topiramate following the 92 milligram dose only. Uh, once again, patients with mild hepatic impairment on, would receive a higher steady state exposure than uh, compared to those observed in normal patients. And again, for comparison, looking at the NCA results from the hepatic impairment study, the empirical AUC values are comparable to the simulated ones. Well, as I mentioned before, the patients with moderate hepatic impairment should not exceed the mid-level dose of 7.5 milligrams. And the modeling results are consistent with this, since the 7.5 milligram dose in the moderately impaired patients is an AUC uh, a steady state value of 1584 uh, nanogram hours per ml, which doesn't exceed the steady, sta the steady state AUC following administration of the higher, uh, the highest 15 milligram dose in normal patients. And similarly for topiramate, the steady state AUC for moderately impaired patients is well below the safe maximum dose given in normal patients. So to conclude, um, our simulations confirm that the dosing regimen adjustments based on the single-dose hepatic impairment study were appropriate, namely that no dose adjustments are necessary in mild hepatic impairment patients and dose escalation to the 15 milligram uh, fentramine 92 milligram topiramate dose is permitted if necessary, whereas the moderate hepatic impairment patients may only receive 50% of the maximum dose level and should not exceed the 7.5 milligram maintenance dose. So I hope that you've all seen how modeling and simulation in Phoenix and LME can help you with exploring various dosing regimens, as well as verified drug exposures in different patient populations. Thanks so much for your attention.